Hi, Toby. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you today. Uh, I'm Imogen and I'm studying history of art at UCL. Hi, guys. I'm Mohammed and I, I'm a recent fine art painting graduate of Campbell University. And I'm going to start with the first question. It's a nice and easy one. So, Toby, how did you first get into art and painting? Um, so I'd always been doing art at school um, in my like GCSEs and then in my A-levels I took art as well and it was one of my favourite subjects and it was something I was really good at so I decided to just continue doing that and then I did an art foundation and then I studied art at university. That's really interesting, do you feel like at school level or home level it was something that was supported? What did you say? No, I, I asked, um, did you feel like at, school, at a school level, or even at a home level, did you feel like it was something that was supported as a career? Um, maybe not in school. It wasn't really talked about to be a career. I was just kind of doing things I was interested in. And I knew that I would be able to spend time studying. But at home, when I said I wanted to like study art, my parents were really supportive of me. And yeah, they want me to like make my own choices and live my own life. I know like it's quite difficult from like African or ethnic backgrounds sometimes, like if you want to be a creative, but my parents are really supportive. And that's great to hear. At what point do you feel like it was something that you would fully commit to? Was that more so around like university or did you know even before that? Um, I'd probably say like last month in March, I felt like I was like, okay, I'm going to be an artist and do it properly. And it was a recent thing because I found it quite difficult to like make works and be consistent um, because it's kind of like you make your own work and no one tells you what to do and that can be quite difficult. So... It was, it's been a journey really since I graduated in 2019 and kind of figuring out what path I wanted to go on, what type of works I want to make. But I feel like now in April 2021, I feel more confident in myself about the art that I'm making and like the direction that I'm going in. That's really interesting that, I mean, I know that through research that you've had a lot going on since you graduated, but it's only last month that you um, actually decided that you want to really really pursue that that's really interesting we know that through our research you moved around a lot growing up at age seven you moved from Nigeria to here how has um, those experiences of migration and displacement shaped your identity I think that shaped my identity quite a lot um, it influences the way I speak like I've lived most of my life in Liverpool but if I tell someone that they'll be like oh <clears throat> they'll be like oh you don't sound scouse at all but it's because I was born in Nigeria and I've moved to the UK, like you said, when I was seven. But whilst here, I also lived in the northwest of England in somewhere called Rochdale. And then my family moved to Liverpool. And I just think like my whole life is an amalgamation of all of these places. Um, and it also shapes like my art as well. Um, I think that's like the major thing major theme that I explore within my artworks, like being born in a different continent um, and now living here in the UK. And also it's quite notable for me that I haven't been back to Nigeria since I left when I was seven. So that was like 18 years ago. And yeah, it's something that I'm always thinking about. It's a place that I want to go back to because obviously that's where I was born and it's make it makes part of a large part of my heritage. Yeah. Do you have more of a connection to one sort of background or like location more than others? Um, I don't think so. I feel like I'm a type of person that can make home anywhere, but I don't know if that's because of how I was brought up moving around so often or that's just how I am now. But yeah, I definitely feel like I could live anywhere in the world, but I like it here for now. I mean, you did go to Madrid for a year as well, right? Yeah, I lived in Madrid um, in 2018. 
and I really loved it there. It was like, a, I always call it like a cheaper version of London. And there's like so much art in Madrid, like, yeah, the art there is really amazing. Um, and it's a really great cultural place. I just love Spain as a whole as well. I think everything's cheaper than London to be fair. Yeah. Um, we know that um, in your practice, you work across different medias like drawing, painting, print, also sculpture. What led you to explore such a diverse range of practices? Um, so when I first got to university, I was working with painting, um, acrylic painting, because that's what we did in my like A-levels and my art foundation. And that's all I knew really. Um, and then I got to university, I wanted to kind of explore because there's so many different workshops, there's all these different things you could create. Um, so that's kind of why I went into doing things like printmaking. I started doing silk screen printing. Um, and this is like really popularized by like Andy Warhol. Mm -hmm. um, and I just love like he, that you can make an image so colorful. So I started doing that and that didn't really work for me because yeah, I didn't like how bright the colors were. And then I, <clears throat> and then I realized that I could make an image look exactly like a photograph using, it's called CMYK printing with um, the four different colors could make up the entire spectrum. And that's something I really like doing. Um, and then in terms of like drawing, yeah, I think it's just a really quick way to get out your ideas. And with sculpture, that's something that I kind of developed because I wanted to make a bronze mask um, to kind of speak about the bronze masks from Nigeria and the Benin tradition. With your drawings and stuff like that, your drawing, your prints and stuff like that, you have separate works. Do you consider much of them to be preliminary works or works in their own right or something in between them too? Yeah, I think it's a mix of all of those things. Um, like I said, I like how fast you can make a drawing compared to a painting. So there's like really quick drawings. I might call them sketches to make a bigger painting. But then recently I have been making drawings which I wouldn't make into a painting. I would just leave the drawing on its own as its own work. In terms of influences, who and what influences? And in the art world and also besides the art world, what kind of things influence your work and inspires you? So I would say my like biggest influence in as an artist is an artist called Injadeka Akunyuli Crosby. And she's a Nigerian American artist. Um, and she makes painting drawings um, because they kind of sit between the space of like painting and drawing. She uses materials like acrylic, oil paint, um, marble, loads of different things in her works and also collage and she was born in Nigeria and moved to um, America to study at university. So I feel like also in our life experiences, we're quite similar and a lot of her work I can relate to because of that. And she uses imagery from like her family albums, which is something I do as well. And yeah, she's just an artist that I really love. Um, and in terms of other influences, I would just say, yeah, my heritage and my identity of being Nigerian, um, being a black woman really influenced my work. Hi, Toby. Um, could we talk about some of the works that you have, if you could share your screen? Yeah. Um, could we start with Gele Bebe? I'm just trying to do a full screen. <laughs> there you go. Can you see? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, 
uh, what's this supposed to be showing now? Because right now it's just saying Tobu Alex Andre portfolio of artworks. Can you see it now? Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, I really, really like this one for the multi, like multimedia layering, which you were talking about earlier. Um, can you maybe talk a bit more about the work and like the processes in particular? Yeah, so in this work, I used acetone transfer on canvas to create these like um, yeah, imagery in the back, in the background of the paintings. So basically I would print out images really big on like A3 paper and then put acetone, like nail varnish remover on top of them and kind of rub the ink into the canvas. And it's a really long process. It took me, yeah, a very long time. And I haven't done it since maybe because of that. Mm -hmm. But it was a kind of a alternative way for me to put imagery straight onto canvas. And I previously done that in my other work, Mirror Me, which I did with a silk screen print. Um, and I chose to kind of put those images in the background because I wanted a way to, for people to directly see the imagery that I regularly work with or the images I'm regularly thinking about. And then I just painted on top of it with- Is the painting on top? A, a copy of a photo that you have? Or... Yeah, so the painting on top is taken from a photograph that I've selected from my family album. Is it like you? Are you in the photo? Are you in the painting? No, um, <laughs> I actually don't remember who these people are. <laughs> okay. Um, but maybe my dad does and he can put it in the back. <laughs> Um, and we were just wondering how you selected the how you select images which you do incorporate into your paintings. Yeah, um, I guess it's just like an intuition that I have when I look through. So, like before I went to Madrid, I just looked through my family's albums. We have loads of them that we brought from Nigeria, and I selected maybe thirty images, and yeah, I've just been drawn to those images. I feel like they, they have like a vibrancy about them or they reflect Nigeria or they speak about memory or they speak about like nostalgia. Mm -hmm. All the people in them just look really beautiful and happy. And yeah, it can just be as, as simple as that. And I, I love the images as well, like of my parents when they were younger and they look like really joyful and mm -hmm. it's really like strange to see you but I like that they're frozen in that moment um that kind of brings it on to you know shadow selves the painting yeah and I also incorporated um process mm -hmm. images oh cool yeah so there's a few of these a few of these images are in the um painting Gale baby uh, okay. That's my dad. <laughs> and this is the image I painted from. Oh, yeah. Um, with is this yeah between two worlds it's supposed to yeah be. yeah um we how we were just wondering how you decide like because obviously that's from a, a photograph but we were wondering how you decide what to keep in from the photograph and what you is it just quite a natural like when you're creating you just it, intuition again or yeah yeah so in this work i actually created it from a collage mm -hmm. um but before the collage was an image, and I just was trying to evoke some sort of feeling of like portals or different worlds, transformations, things like that. So I guess it depends on what my kind of goal is with the image that I'm using. 
So in this case, I just decided to use this doorway and this image of me um, when I was younger. And it's like, I'm dressed up for like a special day at my school. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't usually wear clothes like, like that. So it's quite a significant image. And also I think it speaks a little bit about my personality like now and then as a child because like I was known for not really liking photos so I look very distressed <laughs> um yeah and I just wanted to bring that in with like um my life now and living in London so that's why I kind of have this imagery of the um like cityscape of London yeah I really like that collage that's really nice um, with shadow, with shadow selves, the piece um, we found it really interesting because it's one of like a few of the works which aren't portraiture, kind of which don't include like a a figure in the painting. Um, but I also know that having read about shadow, the term that you use, shadow selves, um, it's kind of to describe another version of yourself which you feel is living in Nigeria still. And I was just wondering um, how about the title of this work and how it relates to the to the landscape to the kind of landscape painting yeah um i think like the absent absence of a person kind of is very noticeable because that's what a lot of my work looks like now but yeah this work was made in 2017 so Prior to this, I was only making landscapes. So maybe it looks strange now. Because, <laughs> like all I do now is make portraits. Right. Um, but that is something something I do want to explore further, like landscapes and where we exist, mm. and places, things like that. Yeah. Um, but this was also made from a collage. And this was the collage that I made on a walk and it was actually part of a project in uni, um, like a group collaboration project, but I managed to take a lot of photographs of my area in London at that time. And there were some artists that I was looking at as well um, that really influenced me that were always also working in collage. And yeah, I guess that's how that work came about. But yeah, it's strange because now all I do is portraits, so it's like, oh, that's a landscape. No, yeah, it's really interesting, like, perspective-wise. I really liked it. Um, we wanted to just learn a bit more about the term shadow self, to be fair. To be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, it's just something that I was thinking about, and I was doing some writing to come up with some titles of some works that I'd made. And um, because that's just usually how I come up with a title. I just have a time to just sit and write. And I guess some people might call it like poetry. Mm. Um, and I was thinking about reflections and identity in that way as well. And in this painting, actually, there is, I always talk about like this reflection here not being true because the sky is like actually not like why it's yellow um, and kind of linking this to like a personality and I guess like the alternative me living in Nigeria and things like that and when I speak about like the version of me that's still in Nigeria I just like I'm like what if I never left the country kind of thing like I'd be a different person than I am now. And I always imagine like what that person would be. Like, would I be able to speak my native language, cook certain foods, things like that? Yeah. Um, under your shadow self, I was really interested in whether you considered that your shadow self to be literal or spiritual. Um, Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Sorry, uh, I want to ask whether you consider you had to be a, a spiritual concept. If I have a spiritual concept. So 
sorry, Mohammed, I think you're breaking up a bit. But um, the question that he was asking Toby is to say whether you consider shadow selves to be uh, literal or spiritual. Um, I never really thought about it in those terms. So I guess I'm not really sure. I think it was more like a, maybe like, like an emotional thing. Um, or just the perspective of how I viewed myself. Like I don't physically think that there is another version of me, but I just like, hmm, I wonder if there was like a kind of a daydream kind of thing. Have you ever, am I, am I, can you hear me clearly now or is it a bit shaky still? You can hear me? Yeah, okay, cool. I was also wondering, well, I think it's interesting either way. But I think it raises a, the concept, raises a curiosity about whether or not at some point you'd, you'd interact with your shadow self. Like, have you ever considered writing letters to your shadow self or embodying it? Um, no, but I do make works with like multiple versions of myself in one work um, to kind of speak about like these multiple identities, these different places I'm from these different personalities, things like that. I found another one of your works, um, my other, your um, the sculpture, right? You captioned as looted from Nigeria to the British Museum, so I made my own. Could you tell us a little bit more about that work and within that context as well? Um, yeah, so I went to the British Museum maybe in like the first or second year of my degree. And I've never been there before, but it was really great to like go to the Africa section and see works from Africa um, and see like bronze masks and all these different things. And also there was specific works from Nigeria, but I didn't know how they came to be there at that time to be fair. But I really enjoyed that experience. I felt really connected to my heritage and seeing these works. And something that struck me was that a lot of the bronze masks looked like people that I know now. They had similar features. Like I talk about like almond eyes and like wide noses and high cheekbones. They look like people now, like contemporary people, African or West African people you might see in London. And I found that like really strange. So I wanted to kind of make my own mask of my own face that could potentially be in the British Museum. Um, and I say like looted because then I learned about the history that the British came to Nigeria and they kind of plundered and took these works and they, yeah, they're now displayed in the British Museum. And I know there's things going on about, perhaps they'll return them soon, but yeah, for now they're still in works in the British Museum. You think you'll continue making these kind of works at some point maybe? Yeah, I definitely want to make more masks um, and explore like different facial expressions, different materials as well. Um, yeah, I have some pictures of the process as well. It was a really long process, but I liked how it was different from painting. And it was really, yeah, I felt like it was physically so different and you kind of didn't know how things would turn out in the end. So that was something that was really exciting about making like a sculptural work. I'm gonna ask you a question from chat actually let's let's see what we have here i was wondering whether toby's memories of nigeria are still clear have you based your works on any specific early memories of nigeria um my memories i was speaking about memories this week actually and i think people say that the last time you remember something is the last memory you have of it so our memories are always changing and you can't be sure if they're true or not. So now I really don't know how true my memories are because also I look a lot at my my family's albums and it's hard to tell if 
like I have a memory or I just remember this photo really well. Um, so I really don't know. But sometimes I talk to my mom and like, I remember driving on the street and this happened. And she's like, wow, how do you remember that? Like you're three. <laughs> so I guess I do have some memories, but it's kind of unclear. I remember things like my house and like my area where I used to live, but not really strong memories. Another question we have here is, I was wondering why you decided to develop your collages into painting as opposed to the collages being the final work. I think the collages are a final work. Like I see them as a work on their own, but I also like to use the imagery, like I mentioned of my family's photo albums. And I like, I don't just wanna like paint from a picture. So that allows some sort of like disruption, making a collage um, for me to paint from instead of just like painting a photograph. It just makes things more like exciting to me. I just wanted to ask some questions ahead about your studio ahead of the little tour. Um, and we were just wondering, um, what are your top three studio must-haves? Um, I think everything that I need to paint. <laughs> um, but I would say, like, I've been thinking of, as the studio, as a space to just make. And then we spoke previously, and I talked about an artist who said that they didn't do emails in their studio because they feel like it defiles the space. And I kind of have that kind of attitude now because, yeah, I just want to be here and make work. I don't really think I should do much else here. And it, so, yeah, sometimes it just gets confusing. If I'm not making work, then it could be a really, like, tough to get back into it again. So when I'm here, I just try and always draw or paint something. So maybe paint and a pencil would be the most important thing. And um, how much time do you spend like on rough, roughly in, a, in your studio? Uh, I'm here like every day and probably like eight hours, like a regular working yeah. day. Yeah, because I know that you talk about, because you're now in March taking it as a full career. So I was just wondering as a young artist, how you kind of organize studio work, like as a job alongside other aspects of your life? Yeah, so right now I'm working as an artist and I'm also the co-founder of Platform Black. And because that's something I created myself, I can kind of organize that around my, my own time um, so it's quite flexible and yeah I can basically do what I want um, right now. So Ruth can we take one more question from the comments it says um, do you look forward to visiting Nigeria again and what do you look forward to the most? Um, I think a lot about the food. I can't like wait to eat the food. I really want to visit like the beaches and see like the ocean. Um, I think like the Atlantic Ocean has a really interesting relationship with Africa and West Africa and the history as well. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. Um, and also just being in the warmth and getting a tan. Yeah, I, I was in um, yeah, Nigeria just uh, I think about a year and a half ago. So I really get that feeling of, you know, the crowd, you know, particularly, you know, I usually land in, in Lagos and that sense of people just being all around with the heat that kind of engulfs you as you step off the plane is kind of unparalleled to anywhere uh, but it's it's just so vibrant that um that place we also had a question on which says um 
yeah first of all thanks to your dad for giving so much kind of insight also into the photos and I wondered whether you'd ever considered doing a maybe a talk with your dad um you know because he he gives so much commentary on your work in a way that perhaps you wouldn't be able to bring those memories to you so is it something you'd ever considered before um I've never considered doing a talk but I have recently been thinking about documenting both my parents histories um I think that'd be really like important to like just record conversations that we have and maybe write things down or make videos because yeah that's knowledge that is really important and it can be lost easily as well and I'd like to like pass that down as well to like future generations um so yeah soon I'm gonna be voice recording my parents conversation Oh, we look forward to, to that. I think that brings on me to another question that says, well, do you feel any shyness about using your image for the artwork? Um, I think I did in the beginning. I did, I was like, I didn't know, I just didn't want it to be me. And in the first, my first ever like, um, portrait of a person it was like my sister and I was really really tiny on the painting like super small but now I don't I don't I don't feel a way about it because I don't think of these as like portraits of me I think of them as like different facets so it's not necessarily like a painting of me in that kind of sense like I don't think I've yet done like a self-portrait um but I hope to do one soon that's really interesting um it, it kind of takes me to you know when you say you haven't done a work that's a self-portrait um however I'm looking at the work that's right behind you um which is the one with your which was drawn from an image of your passport photo from I think when you left Nigeria and um, yeah, H what do you consider that work as, if not a kind of self-portrait? I think like when I think of self-portraiture, it's like really like old school and like someone sitting in a chair and like having this outfit on, something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know what I would call all of these works of my face, I'm not sure. It's something to think about though. Maybe just like shadow selves, you might create a new term for it. Um, we're all up for that. Um, as a question or in fact, well, partly a comment and then also a question from Inyaki that says, in the first work he showed, the major part of the body presented was filled with memories that you don't want, you don't know who the people are. It reminded me of a film by the name of um, I apologize for this, Yora, no, I'm not gonna say it, um, but you can read it, Toby. And it says, I'm from a place which in reality never existed, which explores exiles returning to the place they call home. To what extent is your relationship with the home imaginary, personally and in your work? I think it's a lot of imagination and like I always talk about like going back to Nigeria and it being kind of an amazing experience but in, re in reality it might not be it might just be like another country or something and it's definitely hyped up in my mind and yeah I think my home is too fantastical now in my mind so I, I really need to go back soon before all my dreams are kind of ruined Sometimes when I talk with my friends from Nigeria, they're like, it's not that great. So <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's a bit, yeah, it's definitely a lot imaginary. And there's the idea of like homecoming being greater than it actually is. So it'll be really interesting to see how I feel when I get there. But I know for sure I'll, I'll love the food. So, yeah. What's your favorite food? 
Um, I'm really simple. I like like rice and stew and plantain. Um, there's one question from Eliza here that says, what do you think is the best way to get the most out of an art foundation as a person who wants to go into creative careers in the future? Uh, and also what draws you to portraiture? Um, I think in terms of art foundation, this is really hard, but you just have to be open to like experimenting and trying new things. And that's just something I just didn't know how to do in Art Foundation. And they tried to draw it out of me, but I found it really difficult. Um, but also like knowing what it is that you want to pursue. I think maybe I found it difficult because I wanted to paint and they wanted me to do all these different kinds of things, but there can be so much experimentation within paint. I don't know like what mediums you're working in, but yeah, maybe just trying to push your like medium to the furthest level and going to see lots of shows and exhibitions. I think that always helps to like develop your like education. Um, and what draws me to portraiture? So I would say that when I went to Madrid in 2018, I, I mentioned like there's so much art in Madrid and I discovered a lot of like amazing Spanish painters. And I feel like in Spain, I really got the art education that I wanted because I got to learn about all these like painting masters and yeah, just like masters of art and oil painting and <clears throat> being able to see their works just really inspired me to paint people. And then yeah, it was around the time that I was looking at my family albums and being really like obsessed with Nigeria and wanting to connect with my past selves or past self. Um, and that's kind of how the portraiture thing started. Um, do you want to take us around your studio? It'd be wonderful to see some of the works up close and also other things that you're working on as well. Yeah. Um, I'll go to these works first. So this is a painting that um, I made last week and it was quite a quick work, but it's based on a photograph of myself um, from Nigeria as a child. And yeah, it's, ba it's on linen and it's an oil painting. And in the photograph of myself, I actually have a really strange kind of look on my face. And I, yeah, I just love that way of photography of capturing strange moments. And that's something I wanted to replicate on um, a painting. And then I have, this work as well. And these two are my most recent paintings. And this is a work that I, yeah, that features like multiple versions of myself. And yeah, this isn't a work that I would call a, like a self portrait, but maybe like a narrative of something because there's like something going on in the work there's a woman getting her hair done and there's like three other women around her. So it's, yeah, I'm interested in like storytelling and yeah, something like that. And the people are collaged in a way because they're like overlapping and underlapping and it kind of doesn't make sense, but that's something else I like about painting that you can create your own version of the world. Um, yeah, and yeah, those are the two most recent of my works. And then I'll move on to this work here. This work down there is called We Will Come Find You. And that's kind of based on journeys and being like born in Nigeria and the journey of moving here. Um, as a young child and 
having three different versions of myself in this work to kind of speak about like shadow selves or different identities, different personalities <clears throat> and different ways we like um, show people who we are. Like, yeah, being from like a different city, like when I came to London for university, people know me as a different name from like my friends in Liverpool. And at home, people, my family call me a different name as well. So like all these different Tobys, Alexandras, Alexes, I kind of featured in this painting here. Uh, and I also mentioned that I was doing drawings and this is like my, I'd say my most recent drawing work. And yeah, it's a few different me's and in the hand of me is like me again. And I was kind of thinking about my bronze mask when I made this mask here. Um, I'm just exploring drawing and it's something that's quite new to me. I started doing it during the pandemic and now I'm working on larger scale drawings and I like, yeah, yeah, I mentioned how I like how quick it is. So that's what I'm working on there with drawing. Um, and over here I have some like smaller paintings on paper that are gonna be in an exhibition I have coming up. Um, yeah, and these are just oil paintings on paper and I've never painted portraits on oil before. I would say these are, yeah, they're quite different from like my other paintings. They're less, they're less like storytelling and more like people and identities. And then I just have on my wall some different people's faces I was working on and I was just experimenting with different um, materials and these are like oil pastel so yeah that, that, that's a material I haven't really worked with but I found it really fun and really quick and I'm just trying to be like less precious with my works because with painting it's so slow so when I have an idea, I just try and get it out on somewhere. And I was just trying that with the oil pastels. And some of them I don't really like understand or enjoy, but they look really colorful and fun. And it's, yeah, it was really fun for me to make those works. Um, then I just have another drawing here that I'm working on. And then there's another drawing here. It's a bit more faint, but that was something, that was like one of the first, <clears throat> that was one of the first drawings um, I was working on when I came into the studio. I feel like it's really influenced like some of my other works. Um, it's influenced the other, paint, other painting of like the lady doing her hair. Um, yeah, and that's it really in the studio. We did have two um, questions. It says, is there a medium that you haven't tried yet, but would like to? Yeah, I really like film and Yeah, film, videos, things like that. And I'm not sure how it would work for me, but I love taking pictures already. So I could definitely see myself making like a film. Uh, yeah. And do you know, do you always know what you're going to work on when you're, when you get to the studio? Um, does the story yeah. as you're painting? Yeah, I always know what I'm going to work on because I'm not usually working on more than one piece at a time. 
but that is something I'm trying to like change because I have to make quite a few works over this year so I think it'll be better for me to like work on a different piece and sometimes you get bored and or like um stuck so that's something I'm gonna try and explore And when uh, Duchamp and Sons were doing their research, they came across Solange on your Instagram and how that was inspiring this subject of hair that you'd mentioned. Can you talk a bit more about that? Talk a bit more about hair. Well, you know, or Solange and how that has inspired that focus on the subjects of hair. Um... I know other people as well or braiding traditions in general? Yeah, I think that in my paintings, I'm just trying to like put different things there. And I might, I might not be so sure of what they mean, but <laughs> I know that I have hair and being a black woman, having hair is like a political thing. So yeah, that's just something that I, bring into the work to speak, I guess, a little bit about that. But it's also just like, yeah, I just have hair and that's what it is. And it's an Afro or my hair is really big and I want to like document this in a painting. Yeah. Yeah, those um, traditions of like hair or braiding or, you know, different forms of, um, almost kind of like sculpting hair um, in the, you know, in the African context is very interesting. Um, how hair also is for identity and also, you know, in some cases, I, in some cases, identifying the tribes that you're from and um, traditionally or historically as well. So there's a long kind of, you know, line of discovery when it comes to un unpicking what this political, um, you know, context surrounding hair is, is about it's quite interesting um yeah but there's many kind of stories that I've come across I, I read um a book which is really good by a Sierra Leonean author or Sierra Leonean Scottish author um called Aminata Fauna um where she talks about um her, her father was part of the kind of the group that um were resisting um, well, her father was part of the group that brought about independence in Sierra Leone, but at the same time, once they had their first president, the, um, because of the corruption, her father became, you know, kind of went onto the opposing side of the politics and began to um, work to, to um, unseat the president. And that brought about a whole issue which led to him being, um, what's the word, uh, assassinated with six people and around that time in Sierra Leone, I think it was about like 60s or 70s, um, the women would create these hairstyles um, you know, as a form of kind of um, visual protests um, rather than trying to kind of, you know, because they, they were silent so they couldn't really speak their mind. So there was a kind of, you know, hair became this kind of visual protest to actually talk about their allegiance to this group of, of assassinated uh, men. So yeah, the, the idea of hair as politics is quite an, a really interesting one um, in African context, as well as a, um, a kind of Western or kind of, I guess, transatlantic black kind of context uh, as well. Um, one question that also came up was, uh, do you have happy accidents? <laughs> when working in the studio are the moments where um, you know things just happen and you think wow this is great yeah I think you have to allow for those moments like in painting um because yeah I make a plan I make a sketch but then things might not always turn out well most times it's not like what I wanted but it's like encouraging like just coaxing out of the painting what it wants to say. So it's a little bit of a plan and then a little bit of just letting things happen. Um, 
I think we're going to move on to uh, Platform Black now. So if you have any questions, please feel free to keep dropping them into the chat and we'll pick up on them as time goes on. Uh, so Toby, one of the, um, I know Platform Black or Represent at the time when you first started was prompted by this lack of diversity um, that you faced at Wimbledon when you were, stu you were studying or also um, yeah, lack of diversity in the curriculum, lack of diversity in the kind of the student body as well. Um, can you tell us a bit about that and what yeah. led you to begin it? So I co-founded Platform Black in the final year of my degree um, with my friend Alicia and we kind of felt that there wasn't enough like diversity in our curriculum and there was only two of us like black students in our year. So we didn't really have a community and it was kind of lonely, to be honest. So we decided to put on an event and we invited three black women artists to come and speak about their work and their experiences in like higher education. And we invited Shola Olulode, Rachel Jones and Shannon Bono to come and speak about their work. And it was a really great event. And as well as learning about their artistic practices. It just was a space for like black and people of color and people who are interested in that type of work to be together. And that's something um, that I never really experienced at Wimbledon. So yeah, I just had to create it for myself. And we kind of had that problem and we decided the solution was gonna be we'd make an event. And from then we began working with our university and uh, with the University of the Arts London. And we partnered with a team called Creative Shift and they kind of like empower underrepresented students to make a living doing what they love. And we've since had like events with them, with other creatives, with like illustrators, filmmakers, um, curators, all of who have been black and yeah, some of them went to UAL as well, so they could kind of relate with our experiences. Um, and I would say like now what we're trying to do is like carrying on to work with other universities um, all over the UK, because we know the narrative isn't just like in London. And we've actually worked with students from like University of Glasgow or Edinburgh or University of Manchester. and they say similar things too and one of the things Alicia and I um, have, re have been really proud to do is providing those students with like their first ever crit with like a, a black professional or a black creative and that's something that I never ever had I never had a crit with a like person of color or a black um, tutor or lecturer and I feel like that would have been something I would have benefited benefited from so it's been really good that we've been able to give a few like other artists that opportunity um yeah that's that's amazing because it it reminds me of kind of my art school journey um as well no I think you have a question that you wanted to ask I was gonna ask um out of all the sort of UAL universities how comes how, how come you chose Wimbledon it's really interesting. Um, I don't think I chose Wimbledon. <laughs> I think that's all I could, that's all I had basically. Yeah, I wasn't successful in any other applications and I wanted to go to London. I really wanted to live in London and Wimbledon was- Oh, what was, what was your other choices then? I applied to like Central St. Martins, Chelsea, um, I think Leeds, yeah. How important do you think is, is an arts education, especially talking about London universities and arts education in the UK? I mean, I think there's a, like you mentioned, Madrid, and you felt like you got what you wanted out of there. How, how, do you, how important do you think is an arts, arts education, especially when considering what universities, university culture is like in England or UK or even just London? I think you don't need it, but it is helpful. Um, 
and I was able to utilize and kind of get what I wanted from university. But I don't think you should go to university if you're not the type of person to kind of like hustle or like <laughs> like wrestle with the institution. And unfortunately, it's that way. Like, I don't think a lot of people get what they want out of university because it's not what they expected. The experience can be quite like awful if you're like a minority student. So mm. yeah, yeah, I think it's I'll... definitely, sorry. It's definitely no, no, no. And I was only the, the only Asian student in my course. So it was really interesting. Like, so even though I was at Camberwell, which is like South London, and so and there's only I think two black people in my painting court. Let me just make sure that's right. Yeah, two. And we're in South London, and it's like it's a bit strange, you know. I mean, I think sometimes diversity numbers are pumped up by international students and stuff like that, who also I feel like get left behind. So I think it's really interesting thinking about what what universities could do more to encourage a more inclusive arts. Have you ever thought about what kind of steps universities themselves need to take? Um, yeah, I think all education kind of needs help, really, to help all the, like, <laughs> like the non-white students, because I had an event this week on Monday and someone asked, what would you tell your younger creative self? And I said that I would tell them that um, black artists exist and black people in black in paintings exist because that's not something I knew when I was younger like studying GCSE A level A levels because my my teachers just never introduced that to us so I think it needs to like the education of like artists from all around the world needs to start earlier and not just be at university um yeah i i absolutely agree i think um in fact i was at campbell as well years ago but um you know the exact experience that you had was why i chose not to go to wimbledon <laughs> um i think you know just the sense of representation and going to perhaps like an open call sorry an open what do they call it now um those open days um and um recognizing that you know, there might have be, I don't know, you know, in different universities might be a 400 seats a room and there might be only two black students wanting to do art. I think, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of necessity to start pushing this at an early age, because I think a lot of people go into art school, particularly black and other people of color um, with this idea that they, you know, that, that they might be lonely or they, they'll have to kind of build a community themselves and it's not something that's there for them. Um, and they, there's a, it's a, at least for me, it was an understanding that I knew that I was getting into this world that wasn't as you know, representative of my culture, of my you know, color, um, of my race in a way that I, I would like it to. Um, yeah, and, and can you tell us a bit more about the journey about, you know, in Platform Black um, in terms of even how you've gone from represent to Platform Black so you're in a way you know fluid and you're changing and you're always being shaped as you go along so if you can give us a bit more of like a, a journey to where you're at now with it. Um, I saw that you know the change over last year um, in last year and I kind of wondered what preempted that um, change and also what prompted it. Yeah, so basically that name is really common and there's like represent radio. So it's kind of like, and they're like in a similar field. I think they're like a multicultural radio station. So it was a bit confusing. So we just wanted to be unique. So we decided we needed a name change and that's something we've been thinking about for like a really long time. And then we were able to change the name to Platform Black because um, one of like our core values or our mission is to platform black creatives. Um, and in terms of like the journey, we started like in university, like I said, during the final year of our degree. And I always say like, that's the worst time ever. Like 
I don't know why we decided to that we'd never ever done event an event before, but we decided to raise money and do an event in our final year. But yeah, we did it and we kind of did things in a like a backward way because we didn't know what we wanted it to be. We just knew that we needed that space for black people. And now it's like a business or like a yeah, like a business and it took maybe like a whole year for us to like work out a business model, um, like our mission statement, things like that, because we just started, like we wanted to have an event, so we did it. And then we worked backwards and thinking about like revenue streams, marketing, funding, things like that. Um, and now we're at a place where I feel like yeah, we're quite strong in what it is we are. We are a community for like black creatives and we do things like we have events and talks and we currently have an exhibition with University College London Hospitals. Um, and this exhibition is on Euston Road and Alicia and I got invited at the beginning of the year to show work at the street gallery in Euston Road. And we just knew immediately that we wanted to show the work of black women artists. And a lot of the artists that we chose were, were a part of our community and they've come to our events before. And then we curated the exhibition and this opened last week on Friday. So I think this is something that we've wanted to do like since the very beginning as well. When we realized that represent was a thing, we knew that we wanted to do an exhibition. Um, and it's just really great that the opportunity came up for that, like this year. And we've been able to do most of the things that we wanted to do. We've been able to work with our university, have events at the university, um, speak with people like higher up in the university, you can make changes and they're aware of the work that we do. And yeah, I think that's really important for us. Um, so a couple more questions have come through so let's see what we have I uh, Maya says I've heard some things about racism and discrimination within UAL um, Instagram from the Instagram page UAL truth what was your experience like did you ever experience microaggressions racial discrimination from the staff or from other students and she says she's just asking because she's considering going there next year but uh, she's kind of concerned about the things she's heard. Yeah, university is concerning. Um, but yeah, my experience was like, there was definitely like racism and just the fact that the university is a university, so it's like institutionally racist. So there's not things in place to support black students and there's like statistics about black students getting less firsts than white students um so already things are like kind of against you but i don't know if there is a but <laughs> yeah i i went and i survived and yeah, I just, I kind of had like a tunnel vision eventually and I knew what I wanted from um, my education. When I realized that I wanted to paint, I knew that, okay, I have to, yeah, I just have to make, make the work that I want to get the most of out of the workshops, out of all the opportunities. Like I was always applying to things. I was always going to all the events that my university did offer. I was always in the library reading and speaking with the librarian librarians and I became like really good friends with them. Um, I think it's all about like leveraging what you can and like leaving the rest. And hopefully in time institutions will change and become better for like everyone. But yeah, it is quite difficult and you have to kind of look after yourself and your mental health and I would say like, try and make friends, try and have a community if you can. Um, or maybe you can even start something up in your university like Alicia and I did. 
Um, it's a shame that we did it in our final year. I'm sure it would have been really good to start earlier, but yeah. And there's a question also on, uh, have you considered reaching out to your old school with comments about the lack of diversity in artists uh, you were introduced to or we were introduced to, she says. I haven't actually, but it's a really good idea. I should do that. I think that would be, I think that would be great. You know, as you're saying, and particularly with, in my work with, with young people, um, 15 to 24, I realized that these conversations need to start at a much earlier age. Um, so I think you'd be like a wonderful example to, to share and, you know, your experiences, the, 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 you know, the good, the bad and ugly, like they usually say. Um, and yeah, to kind of almost, yeah, some people can have a real view of like what it's like. I think the trajectory of becoming a young black creative can be so obscure sometimes that it's important that these conversations and these kind of histories or journeys are shared so that we have a better understanding of how people get in there. So yeah, please do share that, uh, get in contact with them or yeah, or something. Um, my thinking of doing an art foundation at Camberwell. Mohammed, you did that foundation yeah. as well. Sorry. I'd say, that, I'd say that the foundation at Campbell, well, um, I, I enjoyed it. I think it does depend on courses as well because I think painting, quite often you have really cool tutors. I think at foundation, you do you will find, um, I know that on the painting, it depends on which specialism you go into, but um, um, you do have some people that can be quite brutal in there in their critique of you and stuff like that. But at foundation, I think there's a bit more diversity and more of a range of people who you'll find that sort of like grounded. You'll probably find your group there. But when it comes to going into university degree, you'll find that the very sort of diversity in terms of the people that are there. You know what I mean? So I think foundation, there's more of an opportunity to, you know, find your group and whatever, whatever. Whereas when you go into degree, it's, it's a bit more difficult and you do have to kind of fend for yourself in terms of how you, you know not be self-destructive and how you can get into it. but foundation I, I I really enjoyed my foundation at Campbell I definitely recommend it but it, yeah it depends on degree level it depends on what course you're going into sometimes people are talking about communication degrees some people are talking about photography some people talk about painting at times so yeah painting for me I think was cool though. there are issues choose as a whole though at university I do feel like beyond the tutors there's a level of care that doesn't exist I think that's that's the most important thing that I'd have to say. Um, Georgie also says she's doing that foundation now Maya so if you want to have a chat with her um, do that and anybody who wants to have a chat about foundation perhaps this is another session that we can have um, with Dusha and Sons um, but just kind of coming up to the question of care what does what does care look like for you, Toby, um, in a in a climate that has been so uncaring and so fraught with so much kind of pain, um, particularly in the last year, but you know, in many years, what does care look like? I think for me, it's like fully switching off from the world and being committed to, yeah, like my own self and what's best for me. And that looks like reading, cooking, um, relaxing and just, it might be even watching films, um, being with my family. That's something that I really enjoyed um, during lockdown. I didn't realize that I like missed them so much whilst I was living in London. And in, in lockdown, we're like forced to be together all the time. And I really liked it. Um, yeah, just being around people that love you and you love as well. Um, yeah. Thank you, that's so important, yeah. <laughs> I saw on your Instagram that you were, um, you and your friend were, who started Platform Black were um, kind of rebranding a bit with the, not rebranding, but kind of 
um, rethinking the like future a bit and stuff like that. And I was just wondering how, like, if you have any future aspirations for it or how you think. Um, I think that we want to definitely continue the work that we've started. But the whole reason for like the whole rebranding and stuff, it's because it just like happened. Like it wasn't, we didn't set out to make a business or make something. We just put on an event and then it kind of went from there. And I guess we were so blessed that people in our university were interested in what we were doing and wanted to support us and work with us. Um, in the future, we'd like to work with universities around the UK because the problem isn't just in London, it's everywhere. Um, well, yeah, everywhere in the world, but yeah, definitely all around the UK we'd like to work and we'd like to work with like A-level students, GCSE students, schools, and not just higher education like we've talked about. Um, Yeah, I think those are the majority of our goals and just to carry on doing the work that we do now and exposing black artists to the world and being able to provide opportunities for them as well is really important. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, a lot of our artists in the current exhibition that we curated had never spoken publicly before so it was really amazing to be able to give them that opportunity. And I've never felt so like proud of like creating something when they said like, oh, I've never spoken on a panel about my artwork before. So yeah, that's just something that inspires me, like wanting to show the world that black artists do exist and like they're really amazing. Um. It's now 6.20, so I wanted to ask if you have any last, um, any people, anybody has any last comments, questions? Let's see what comes in the chat. So if it's quite interesting, you've got this, yeah, I like the, the, the title of the exhibition at UCLH is Rest and Repair. Um, it's such a timely, Timely um, title. What 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 led to that? What led to that title? Yeah, we were just thinking about how tough it's been for like people generally, and also like black people. And we've been invited to do this exhibition in a hospital, so we're also thinking about like what hospitals function as, um, and what people were using them at that time. And Alicia and I were really wanting to like have times of rest and we we're always talking about how um because we're like freelancers and we work as well and we're also artists and Alicia has a business so we're always really busy and sometimes it can be quite difficult to like slow down and that's something like the pandemic kind of did for us it allowed us time to rest and repair ourselves um and mental health is also really important for us like we've raised a lot of issues in the this discussion about how university can be very traumatic and triggering for black and people of color. So yeah, we wanted to address that with the exhibition. Um, so that's why we called it Rest and Repair. And yeah, just being like a hospital setting and like the idea of healing um, was really prevalent. And following a year like 2020, we wanted some respite, yeah. Um, There's a question that says, do you have any tips for finding and renting a studio space? I haven't yet rented a studio space. I've been really like blessed that when I graduated, I had a space given to me by my student union so I applied for an opportunity to have a space for a few months and that was like extended. And then after that, I just moved back home and then it was the pandemic. And then after this, I, there was like spaces being 
given to black artists by somewhere called the Couple Project. And I got a space there for six months from July, 2020 to like, well, a bit more till January, 2021. And then following that, I'm now in a space um, that was given to a char an arts charity by like a businessman who had like a spare building in central London. And he was like, yeah, I don't, um, I'm not gonna be using this building for a while. And he gave it to this charity. And then I found out about the charity and then I got a space here and I'm gonna be here until um, about mid June. And then after this, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do, but I know there's loads of different like residencies. So I'm probably gonna apply for a few of those and yeah, something usually just comes up for me and yeah. There's a question um, that says, is there any subject, I think we might have touched upon this already, but it says, is there any subject or technique you would like to try in the future that you haven't already? Yeah, I talked about like wanting to try film because I think so much in imagery and I love photography. So like maybe making a video of some sort. And is there anything else you'd like to share about what you've got coming up? Yes, so we have the Rest and Repair exhibition on right now, and it's on Euston Road. And in those links that I posted, you can like see the address or you can view the exhibition virtually as well. Um, and that's on till mid-June. And hopefully by then we're allowed to like go into the space because it's a hospital, so right now people can't really go and see it physically, but it's like a window gallery. So if you walk past Euston Road, you can look in and see the exhibition. Um, and we also have some events alongside that exhibition. Our first one was this Monday, our opening event, which went really well. And we have two more events coming up. One is gonna be um, on mental health in the black and people of color community looking at what mental health means and we're going to be talking about resources to help um, with mental health so that'll be a really good one to come to because of all the things we've discussed and we have another event looking at what it means to create art for a certain community or for a certain audience and that will be in June and that will be um, half of the artists from the exhibition speaking in that event. And then I have an upcoming exhibition at um, Bernston Batachaji Gallery, and that will be opening in May. I'll put the link as well. Um, and that's a drawing exhibition and some of these works in my studio will be featured in that exhibition. And I also have another exhibition coming up in May in, but it's virtually in 154 New York. Um, and I'll be showing some of the paintings as well in my studio. And yeah, there's a lot of other stuff coming up this year that I'm really excited about. So yeah, just stay in touch on like Instagram. Um, that's probably where I'll post like all my updates and things. It's amazing what you've achieved in such a, a short space of time after graduating. Um, it's really impressive and we can't wait to see what you've got coming up next. Um, just to say that Toby and Platform Black do lots of Instagram lives. So um, feel free to kind of drop in and, and check them out. They did a really good one about Platform Black last week, Friday. So um, if you haven't already followed them, give them a follow and uh, you'll be able to find out what they've got coming on. Um, then, Toby, there's one question that I think we didn't get to touch upon, but I'm actually quite keen to know about, which is how do you how do you come up with the titles for your work? They're so kind of poetic um, and sometimes also quite autobiographical. So I wanted to know how those titles come about. Yeah, so I mentioned when we're talking about Shadow Solves that that can, kind of came about when I had to write titles, like I had to the works were going into exhibition, exhibition, so I needed a title. So I just like sit down and just start writing and it sometimes like turns into poetry. And I think I just look at the work and 
think like oh my god what can I call this and then after that initial panic and like the first few words or the first few phrases are really awful then something good usually comes out um but I think in most of the works of my previous works they speak about identity and like where I find myself physically in the world um my positioning in the world between yeah like between different spaces cultures cities things like that so it's really rooted in um, like my identity and personality but moving forward I think that I've started making a notes page for like phrases that I think might make good titles um I watched a like YouTube like live of a Ghanaian artist who's currently showing at Tate, um, Lynette Yodon Boache, and her titles are amazing, like really, really good. And she talks about how she's a writer, like over being like a painter. And that's something that's so like obvious in her like titles. And she's, she talks about how a title doesn't like explain the work. It gives a different type of context. So that's something I'm aiming for in my titling. Um, we have um, one minute. I wanted to ask if you have any kind of last advice for any person wanting to become an artist, a young artist, like what are your tips or advice? Um, I would say make a lot of work, but I don't mean that in like a stressful, like, oh my God, I have to make work, but just like always do things, always like, always touch your craft often, always practice. Like people call it an artistic pra practice because yeah, you just have to keep practicing and don't be so precious about the work that you want to make and just don't like overthink it, just go for it and do something rather than not do anything. I would say that's what I do now, like, when I feel a bit like stuck or panicked and it really helps me to get ideas out of my head. Also, I think writing is really good. Um, maybe you can write down your ideas or write down poetry. Um, I know a lot of artists do this thing, like wake up in the morning and just write down your stream of consciousness and that might give you different ideas and go to exhibitions as well. Thank you so much, Toby. This has been really insightful. Um, and thank you to Mohammed and Imogen for um, being in conversation with her. I think, uh, and thank you for those who had comments and questions. I think you added to, uh, you know, you, you helped to weave this into a very interesting conversation. So um, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you.